Following a meeting of his party's executive, Sarej said he would be working to help the party develop a new strategy. Eurostar passengers have been hit by delays following an alert in the Channel Tunnel. Rail journeys were temporarily suspended after a carbon dioxide detector went off early this morning. The nearest train, a shuttle carrying 30 lorries and drivers, was evacuated and taken back to the UK. The Afghan president, Hamid Karzai, has become the first foreign leader to visit David Cameron since he became prime minister. Mr Karzai and Mr Cameron had talks at Chequers. A Downing Street spokesman said they'd agreed the relationship between Afghanistan and Britain should be further strengthened. The Foreign Secretary, William Hague, has promised that the government will take a fresh look at extradition arrangements between the UK and America. His comments follow a decision by the previous Labour government to surrender a British computer hacker, Gary McKinnon, to the US authorities. Alex Bushell reports. Gary McKinnon stands accused of hacking into the Pentagon's computer systems, of posing a threat to US national security. And if he is extradited, he could spend the rest of his life in prison. That's why his mother has been campaigning for the last five years for her son, who has Asperger's syndrome, to stand trial here in Britain and not abroad. It's taken its toll on mother and son. He's locked himself away. He's in a terrible state. He was suicidal. We used to extradite people for murder and the like, for serious crimes. But to take someone for computer misuse, which is a five-year maximum sentence here, and threaten 60 years, is totally out of proportion. And Nick Clegg and David Cameron agree, lending their voices in support. But that was when they were in opposition. What about now they're sharing power? They couldn't possibly renege on it. They're a new government. They have to show that they will keep their promises, not uh, uh, renege on them as soon as they're in power. That would look so bad, it would totally destroy the reputation of the new government and it would affect the coalition, I'm sure. One reason why the new foreign secretary was quizzed on the matter during his first trip abroad to Washington. His response, a promise to look again at the extradition treaty. Gary McKinnon has already won the right to a judicial review here at the High Court. A judge will now decide whether the previous Home Secretary's decision to send him to the United States for trial would breach his human rights. But his mother says that's no longer necessary. She's calling on the new government to honour its promises and intervene now. Alex Bushell, BBC News. Now with all the day's sports news, here's Selena Hinchcliffe. Hi, Selena. Thanks, Riz. Hello there. Chelsea won the FA Cup this afternoon and completed the first double in the club's history. Carlo Ancelotti's side beat Portsmouth 1-0, but that only tells half the story. Both sides failed to score from the penalty spot and Chelsea had a hatful of chances in the first half. Our sports correspondent Dan Rowan reports from Wembley. Come on, Pompey! After relegation and administration, this was Portsmouth's chance for a dream end to a nightmare season. At stake for Chelsea, a league and cup double for the first time. The underdogs began brightly, picky on, denied acrobatically by Czech. Portsmouth's brave cup run in adversity has defied belief at times, and their goals seem to enjoy a charmed life. Astonishingly, the woodwork coming to their rescue no fewer than five times in perhaps as one-sided a first half as Wembley has seen. Chelsea were beginning to wonder if it wasn't to be their day, especially when this happened. Portsmouth suddenly had their chance, but Boateng's penalty was poor. Chelsea had survived and almost immediately Drogba finally broke the deadlock. The champions squandered a golden opportunity to seal it, Lampard the latest to miss from the spot, but 1-0 it stayed and Chelsea had won. Portsmouth's season to forget had ended in yet more despair, but double delight for Chelsea, whose grip on English football tightens. With the quality we possessed, that we was always going to get a goal, I felt. Um, you know, we, we, we was a little bit unlucky in the wood about five or six times and... And unfortunately, you know, J-Man made a great save from Didier's free kick in the first half. But, you know, it was important that half-time the manager said just keep plugging away and keep going. Portsmouth must now brace themselves for life in the championship and an uncertain future. Chelsea, meanwhile, have their place in history. Dan Rowan, BBC News, at Wembley. Dundee United are celebrating victory in the Scottish Cup final. They beat First Division Ross County 3-0 at Hampden Park. 
Giant killers Ross County knocked out Hibernian and Celtic on their way to the final. And a growing army of fans travelled down from the Highlands for the biggest match in their club's history. Laura Maxwell was there. It was a modern-day Highland clearance. Ross County rallied a support of 20,000, four times the population of their hometown of Dingwall. Dundee United's fans starved of cup success for 16 years, just as eager for the silverware. And the Hampden crowd didn't have to wait long for the action. County's Gary Miller earning a yellow card for this tackle. United, though, headed it over the bar. Dundee United's Danny Swanson got the best chance of the first half, but it was seen off with more good defending from the First Division side. They couldn't stop United this time, though. A bungled clearance allowed David Goodwillie to put United one ahead. It's in! The Scottish Cup final comes alive at last! Goodwillie involved again for the second goal allowing this superb left footer from Craig Conway. 2-0 to Dundee United! And with just minutes to the final whistle, Conway did it again, putting Dundee United three ahead and ending Ross County's dream. Dundee United! And as Dundee United salute their fans, it's been a superb ending to this 125th Scottish Cup final. Dundee United take home the silverware tonight, a superb end as well to their centenary season. Laura Maxwell, BBC News, Hamden. And in Formula One, Mark Webber will start on pole in tomorrow's Monaco Grand Prix. He beat Renault's Robert Kubica and his Red Bull teammate Sebastian Vettel. McLaren's Lewis Hamilton will start fifth and the defending champion Jensen Button eighth on the grid. And that's all the sport, Riz. Selena, thanks very much. You can see more on all of the stories on the BBC News channel. For now, though, from me and everyone here, a very good night to you.